In this video, we will discover how to develop a long short-term memory LSTM network in Python using the Keras Deep Learning Library. In addition, we will also discover how to automate the process and plot the real-time predictions results with the use of animations from Matplotlib. And I will show you a demonstration on tackling a time series low demand forecasting problems. After this video, you should be able to develop LSTM models for your own time series predictions problems, as well as other more general sequence problems, and also know how to automate the process and visualize the results in real time. LSTM is very different to other deep learning techniques, such as multi-layer perceptrons and convolutional neural network, in that they are designed specifically for sequence prediction problems. LSTM is a unique type of RNN recurrent neural network that is capable of learning long-term dependence, which is very useful for certain types of predictions that requires the networks to retain information over a very long time period. And LSTM networks are very suitable for classifying, processing, and making predictions based on time series and sequence data. Like a typical neural network, LSTM is comprised of layers and neurons. Input data is propagated through the network for predictions. However, in a feedforward neural network, information flows only in forward directions, from the input nodes, through the hidden layers, and to the output nodes. And there's no, it's don't, no cycles or loops in the network. And there are some issues in this specific architecture or feedforward architectures because it cannot handle sequential data very well, and it only consider the current inputs and cannot memorize or take into consideration of the previous inputs. And recurrent neural network and also the LSTM overcome these problems. And unlike neural network, LSTM does not only consider current input, but also consider and memorize the, the previous input in such a way that a higher accuracy can be achieved as mentioned, like recurrent neural network, LSTM has recurrent connections so that the state from previous activations of the neuron from the previous time step is used as a context for formulating the output. In other words, recurrent networks take as their inputs not just the current input example they see, but also what they have perceived previously in time. However, RNN also suffers from two problems. The first is the vanishing gradient problems. Vanishing gradients is that where the weight update procedures resulted in weight changes that quickly became so small and difficult to update the gradients and lead to long training time. The second is the exploiting gradient problems where the weight update procedures resulted in weight changes that quickly became so large, so as to result in very large changes or even overflow and lead to poor accuracy. LSTM has a very unique formulations that allows it to avoid the problems, and LSTM maintains a constant error which allows them to continue learning over numerous time steps and back propagate through time and layers. In short, LSTM overcomes the memory problems that neural network suffers from and overcomes the gradient problems that we current neural network has. With such capabilities in learning long-term dependencies, LSTM is able to achieve impressive results in sequence predictions problems and gains a huge popularity in recent years. Sequence predictions it is different to other types of supervised learning problems. The sequence imposes an order on the observations that must be preserved when training the models and making predictions. And generally, predictions problems that involve 
sequence data are referred to as the sequence predictions problems. And there are four common types of sequence predictions problems, which are se sequence predictions, sequence classifications, sequence generations, and sequence to sequence predictions. No matter which types of problems that you are dealing with, the sequence imposes an explicit order on the observations. And the order is very important, and it must be respected in the formulations of predictions problems that use the sequence data as input or output for that model. And let's go through the four common types of sequence predictions problems one by one. The first problem is the sequence predictions problems. Uh, sequence predictions involves predicting the next value for a given input sequence. For example, if our input sequence is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we expect that the output sequence will be 6. And sequence predictions may also generally be referred to as, as uh, sequence learning. And technically, we can apply it in weather forecasting, stock market predictions, and also the product recommendations. Say, for example, for weather forecasting, given a sequence of observations about the weather over time, and we can predict the expected weather tomorrow. And for stock market predictions, given a sequence of movements of a stock over time, and we can predict the next movement of the stock. And for product recommendations, say for example, given a sequence of past purchase from a customer, we can predict the next purchase for that particular customer. The second type of problem is the sequence classifications problems. A sequence classifications problems involves predicting a class label for a given input sequence. Say for example, if our input sequence is one, two, three, four, five, and we would expect that the output sequence to be good. And then the objective of sequence classifications is actually to build a classifications model use a labeled data set so that the model can be used to predict the class label of an unseen sequence. And these types of classifications problems or techniques are usually applied in DNA sequence classifications at normally detections, sentiment analysis. Say, for example, given a DNA sequence A, C, G, and T values, and we could we would expect that it could predict whether the sequence is for a coding or non-coding region. And um, for abnormally detections, say for example, given a sequence of observations, we would expect that it could predict whether the sequence is abnormally or not. And for sentiment analysis, uh, we would expect that given a sequence of tests, such as a, re a review or some comment, we would expect that it could predict whether the sentiment of the test is positive or negative. And the third problem is the sequence generations problems. A sequence generation involves generating a new output sequence that has the same general characteristics as other sequence in the corpus. Say for example, if we provide two input sequence, one, two, three, and four, five, six, we will expect that it could prov provide the output of sequence of two, four, six. Some example of sequence generations problems include test generations, music generations, and also handwriting predictions. Say for example, uh, given a corpus of tests, such as the work of uh, Shakespeare's, it can generate a new sentence or paragraph of tests that we, they could have been drawn from the corpus. And for music generations, given a corpus of examples of music, that we, we would expect that it could generate a new musical pieces that have the properties of the corpus. And then finally, for the handwriting predictions, given a corpus of handwriting examples, we would expect that it can generate a handwriting for new phrases that has the properties of handwriting in that corpus.
And then last common type of sequence problems is the sequence to sequence predictions. A sequence to sequence predictions involves predicting an output sequence given an input sequence. So for example, if we provide an input sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we would expect that the output sequence could provide a 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Some common examples of sequence to sequence problems include multi step time series forecasting. So for example, given a time series of observations, we will expect that the LSTM can predict a sequence of observations for a range of future time steps. And for example, for a test summarizations, given a document of tests, it could predict a shorter sequence of tests that describes the salience part of the source document. And the last common sequence to sequence problems, that is the program executions. Given a descriptions programs of mathematical equations, we would expect that it could predict the sequence of characters that describes the correct output. Although LSTM is good for solving sequence problems and their results are very impressive, LSTMs may not be a silver bullet and ideals for all sequence prediction problems. For example, in time series forecasting, often the information relevant for making a forecast is within a very small window of past observations. As a result, uh, very often, a typical neural network with a windows or a linear models may be a less complex and more suitable models, and we don't necessarily need to use LSTM to solve the problems. And on the other hand, an important limitation of LSTM is the memory, or more accurately, how memories can be abused. It is possible for us to very often to force an LSTM models to remember a single observation over a very long number of input time steps. This is a poor use of LSTMs and will lead to a poor accuracy. But having said that, after we carefully frame our problems and determine that we really need a LSTM, and the results should be promising. After all, they have been used to demonstrate world-class results in complex problems domains, such as language translations, automatic image captioning, and test generations. Before we move on to the RSTM, let's have a quick look into the recurrent neural network so as to have a better understanding of the basic recurrent relations concept. Let's consider rereading an articles when, and when we read this, we understand each work based on our understandings of the previous works. We don't throw everything away and start thinking from scratch again. Our thoughts and thinking process have that persistence. Traditional neural network doesn't have such characteristics and graphically, it can be seen that only input X can pass information to the output X. Under this architect, the input doesn't gain any additional information from what we it predicts or forecasts so as to improve its output. And therefore, it seems like there is a room to improve the accuracy. To solve this, we introduce a recurrent relation by providing an information feedback loop to connect the output and input. This simple linkage allows information flowing back to the input and improve the overall accuracy. And we define this neural network as recurrent neural network. They are network with loops in them and allowing information to proceed. And the simple conceptions of recurrent neural network is as a type of neural network that takes internal state from previous time step. And graphically, it can be seen that a trunk of neural network takes some input X and outputs a value H. And a loop allows previous information to be passed from one step to the network to the next. Hence, 
everything that the recurrent neural network with a new input and that in, as well as their internal state will also be then fit back into the model. As a result, our model now doesn't only take into account of our current informations, but also the previous predicted informations. And based on this structure, we will now have this pattern where it will with an input, updates its hidden state, and then provide an output. Very frequently, we will want our RNN to not just a single output, and we want it to be able to produce some output at every time step or some sequential output. In this case, we will not only have a sequence of input vector x, but also we will have a sequence of output states vector h. Additionally, RNN makes perfect sense for longer time steps and a larger windows of past observations. As the number of time steps increase, the diagrams might not be a good choice for reviewing how RNN works. And a useful way to visualize RNN is to unfold the network along the input and output sequence. But before we move on to visualize the RNN in an unfolded manner, I also wanted to show you the functional forms of this recurrent neural network, although it is not not our key focus in this video. We can proceed a sequence of vector x by applying a recurrent formula at every time step. And as mentioned, at every time step, we can proceed a sequence of vector x by applying a recurrent formula. And let's take a look on the formula. Because inside the recurrent neural network block, we have a recurrent relations. So we have to, uh, we, we need to have a functions f that can help us to establish these recurrent relations. So this function f will depend on some weight input w, and every time step we will use the same functions and same set of parameters for that. And the functions will help us to accept a pair of informations, which includes the previous hidden state as well as the input at current state. And then this will output the next hidden state, which is called HT right here. This process completes one single step at time t, and we will repeat it until we go through all time steps or go through all the sequence. And so say for example, and as we wait the next input XT plus one, this current hidden state HT will then just pa be passed it into the same functions with next input xt plus one and produce the next hidden stage xt plus one. This process depends on how many time steps we need for our input x and how many time steps we need for our hidden state. But practically, if we wanted to produce some output at every time step of this network, we might want to attach some additional fully connected layers that we in this HT at every time step and make that decisions based on the hidden state at every time step. So this kind of simplest functions form is what we call vanilla recurrent neural network. And mathematical, mathematically, we can separate these functions um, by two steps, like what we have in neural network. The first step is to multiply the previous hidden states and input by their corresponding WHH and WXH. So we make these two multiplications against our two states and add them together and then pass it into a 10H activations functions so we can get some kind of nonlinearity in the system. The main reason why the activations functions here we used it is 10H is because RNN manages an internal state vector whose value should be able to increase or decrease. And for sigmoid, its output is always non-negative. That means value in the states can only increase. Um, it means that sigmoid is not a good choice. On the other hand, for value, they can have very large outputs 
instead of having range a range of negative one and one. So it is very likely that to end up exploiting the hidden state. As a result, 10H is very often to be used to determine the internal state's value. In addition to this architect, if we wanted to produce some YT at every time step, we might have another rate matrix that can accept this hidden state and then transform it to some Y to produce maybe some class scores predictions at every time step. Now let's move back to see how we can better visualize the RNN by unfolding the network along the input and output sequence. And we can think of the recurrent network in two ways. One is the concept of having a hidden layers that feedback at itself recurrently. However, as mentioned before, as the number of times that increase, this computational graph or this conceptual diagram might not be a good choice for reviewing how RNA work. And the second way is to unroll the network along the input and output sequence for multiple time step. And it is an easier and better way to visualize the RNN. To enroll a recurrent neural network, we can think of as multiple copies of the same network, each passing its internal states to a successor. And this makes the data flow of the hidden state, the input as well as the output much more clear. This chain-like latures reveals that recurrent neural network are literally related to the sequence and the list. One of the appeals of RNN is that the ideas that they might be able to collect previous information to the present task. Sometimes we only need to look at recent information to perform the previous task, but there are also cases where we need more context. Unfortunately, as the gate grows, RNN becomes unable to learn to collect the information. For example, if X at time step zero is a very useful information to H at time step T plus one, the gate between the relevant information and the point where it is needed to becomes very large it would be extremely difficult and ineffective to learn to connect the information. And this long-term dependence issues will lead to a poor accuracy in some cases. And because of these long-term dependence issues that RNN has, this motivates the ideas of a long short-term memory that is the LSTM. This is decided to alleviate the long-term dependency problems or the so-called vanishing gradient problems or exploiting gradients problems. So rather than dealing um, the gradient issues directly, we modify a little bit of the RNN architectures to have a better gradient flow properties. Let us zoom in a bit and focus on time step T. In a standard RNN, these repeating modules will have a very simple structure, such as a single 10 edge layer, which combines the information of previous hidden state, as well as the current input. On the other hand, LSTMs also have this chain-like structure, but the repeating modules have different architecture. LSTMs still maintain the input 10 edge structures, but with a little modifications. And additionally, there are also three newly created interacting layer so as to tackle their RN, RNN problems. The core ideas or the key of LSTM is the introductions of cell states, which is the horizontal line running through the tops of a LSTM cell. The cell status one straight through the entire train with only some minor linear interactions. It is very easy for the information to just flow along it unchanged. As a result, even the gap grows between the input and output. LSTMs still 
can able to connect the information if it finds the information useful. In addition, the LSTMs also have the abilities to remove or add information to the cell state, carefully regulated by the structures called the gates. So let's see how a LSTM works. There are two memories that we have to estimate, which are the long-term memory CT and short-term memory HT. Sometimes they have different names. For example, sometimes we call it cell state for long-term memory, and we call it working memory or hidden state for short-term memory. But they are actually referring to the same thing. So in LSTM, we will maintain two hidden vectors at every time step. One is the HT, which is the hidden state vector, and the other is the CT, which is called the self state vector. In other words, LSTM maintains the long term memory as well, the, as well as the short term memory. Unlike the short term memory, the long term memory, or so called the self state, is kind of internal, only kept inside the LSTM. It doesn't really get exposed beyond this LSTM layer. But with this long term memory or this cell state and, four, and the four gates that I will introduce later, the LSTM have the ability to elevate the long term dependence problems that exist in RNN. First of all, let us, let us determine the cell states or so called long term memory. The first step in our LSTM is to decide what information we are going to fold array from the cell state. This decision is made by a sigmoid layer called the forget gate layer. It looks at previous hidden state HT minus one and current input XT and outputs a number between C1 and one for each number in the cell state CT minus one. A number one represent completely keep this, while a number zero represent completely get rid of this. The previous two steps, like a decision maker, it will decide what to forget and what to update. So what we need to do in this step is to actually update the old cell status CT minus one into the new cell status CT. We will multiply the old status by FT, forgetting the things we decide to forget earlier. And then we will add the products of ITGT. This is the new candidate's values scaled by how much we decide to update each state value. The previous three steps are to deal with the long-term memory. And the last step is to deal with the short-term memory Sometimes we refer it to the working memory. In this step, we need to decide what we are going to output. This output will be based on our cell status, but with a filtered version. First, we want a sigmoid layer, which decides which part of the cell status we are going to output. And then we put the cell status through a 10 inch, um, which will be used to push the values to be between negative one and positive one, and then multiply it by the output of the sigmoid gates so that we only output the parts we decided to. To summarize, a LSTM takes our previous hidden states and our current inputs, stat them, and then multiply them by a weight matrix W, and then to compute the four different gates that includes the forget gate, input gate, and the combinations of forget gate and input gate, and then output gate. A forget gate is used to determine how much do we want to forget the cell memory from previous time step. And the input gate is used to determine how much do we want to update ourselves. And then we have a gate to combine the forget gate and input gate to determine how much do we want to update our cell state. Output gate is used to determine how much do we want to reveal ourselves to the outside world. 
In short, the forget gate and input gate are used to uh, are used in the updating of the internal status, and the output gate is a final limiter to determine what the cell actually output. And these gates and the consistent state flow keep each cell stable, neither exploiting or vanishing. Finally, let's take a look on the mathematical representations. Now, if we combine all of the steps and the four gates, we can then form a big matrix to have a better mathematical representations. But before we move on to the next part, let's put the LSTM side by side with a RNN and have a very quick comparison. Remember when we have a Vandeler RNN, it has a single hidden state, HT, and we use these recurrent relations to update the hidden state at every time step. Now in LSTM, as mentioned before, we actually maintain two hidden states at every single time step. One is the HT, which is, this, which is the hidden state, and which is similar to what we have in the RNN, although they are not the same. LSTM also maintains a second vector, CT, which is cell state. Because of this cell state and the four gate, the LSTM has the abilities to alleviate the long-term dependence problems and make it better perform in a particular long sequence and time series problems. Developing a LSTM model is very similar to developing a neural network in Python. And I have a full course on explaining each step for a typical flow for developing a neural network. So here, I will just go through the flow only. So please do refer to the details in that video if you want to know more about each step or any particular step. So let's move on and try to understand how we can develop a LSTM. Typically for developing any neural network or recurrent neural network, it will involve the data collections, data explorations, data preprocessing, model developments, and model evaluations. So similarly, in order for us to build a LSTM, generally speaking, we need to collect data, explore and preprocessing them, and then we need to extract the features and enable that can fulfill the objectives of this project. The features are the inputs, which are the attributes that we think are important for our LSTM models to learn in order for it to predict the outputs, which here are the labels. And of course, these labels have to be well selected in order for us to fulfill the objectives. That said, we should always take our objectives into consideration to collect relevant data at the very beginnings. And most of the steps can be done by pandas. And then we can split our data sets that contains the features and labels into the training, development, and testing sets so as to help us to train our models and evaluate how well the trained model performs. And sklearns and Keras can help us to perform this task. Before we pass these trainings and development sets to our neural network models for trainings, in many cases, we will need to normalize our data. And this is particularly important for LSTM. These normalizations is essential for LSTM networks. It does not only speed up the training process, but also make the LSTM easier to converge. Because SKLearns return the trainings, developments, and testing sets in NumPy and D array, we generally will just need use the NumPy functions here to help us to normalize the or the standardize the data. Once we normalize the data set, we can then design our LSTM architecture. The LSTM models and the architectures of a LSTMs determines how a network transforms its input into an output. The term LSTM's architectures refers to the arrangement of neurons in the layers, 
the connections patterns between layers, activation functions, and learning algorithm. By constructing, by constructing a nice network architectures, the performance of LSTM can be much better. And the next things we need to do is setting the hyperparameters. Being, effect, being effective in developing a LSTMs requires that we organize the parameters as well as the hyperparameters. Some common hyperparameters include the learning rate based on the learning algorithms that you selected in the network architectures, batch size, number of epochs, and any other early stopping criteria to prevent you overtrain your model. Once we decide the model architectures and assign the hyperparameters, we are ready to train the LSTM. Trainings involves making a predictions based on the current status of the models, calculating how incorrect the predictions is, and updating the parameters of the network to minimize this error and, make, and to make the models predict better. And we repeat this process until our models has converged it and can no longer learn. In Keras, there are two main functions, it, uh, including compile functions and fit functions. Developing LSTM is highly iterative. Therefore, before we have the final models, normally we need to use our development and testing datasets to evaluate our trained models. The development dataset would be useful to determine how well your trained models perform and whether there are any overfittings or underfitting issues while the testing dataset will, pro will provide you an additional unbiased evaluations to your training models. If the evaluations in the training set, development set, or testing set are not good, we always need to go back to the previous step and refine our models again. Both development and testing set evaluations can be performed with the use of carrots. As mentioned before, Developing an LSTM is highly iterative, and it has many processes based on random selections and hyperparameters settings. One obvious example is that when we split our data into training set, development set, and testing set, the process is, is already a random sampling. So sometimes we will train a few models and averaging the result, or sometimes we will combine many different LSTM models in order for us to get a better predictions. This process is called ensembling learning, which is very often can be reduced the error and improve the accuracy of our LSTM models. Although developing LSTM is very similar to develop, developing neural network, there are still several key differences that we need to be aware of. The data for our sequence predictions problems probably needs to be rescaled when training a LSTM. When a network is fit on unscaled data that has a wide range of value, it is possible for large inputs to slow down the learning and converge of the LSTM, and in some cases prevents the LSTM from effectively learning our problems. There are two types of scaling of our series, which include normalizations and standardizations. Normalizations is a rescaling of the data from the original range so that all values are within the range of zero and one. However, normalizations requires that we know or are able to accurately estimate the minimum and maximum observable values. We may, be un we may be able to estimate these value from our available data. But in some cases, if our series is training up or done, estimating these, uh, these expect values may be very difficult and normalizations may not be the best methods to use on our problems. In Python, we can use sklearn's mean mass scalar functions to perform the normalizations. And firstly, we need to fit the scalar using available training data, 
to estimate the minimum and maximum observable values. And then we can use that to transform and normalize the data. The second commonly used method is standardizations. This involves rescaling the distributions of values so that the mean of observed values is zero and standard deviations is one. And this can be thought of as subtracting the mean values or center, centering the data. However, standardizations assumes that our observations fit a normal distribution bell curve with well-behaved mean and standard deviations. This is normally correct if our sample size is large enough to represent the populations. However, if these expectations is not met, we may not get reliable results. And in Python, we can use sklearn's standard scalar functions to perform their standardizations. Similar to normalizations, there are st two steps involved. Firstly, we fit the scalar to estimate the mean and standard deviations. And secondly, we standardize the data based on the scalar. Deep learning libraries assumes a retroized uh, representations of our data and assumed input sequence of all features are with same name. In, case, in the case of variable length sequence predictions problems, this requires that our data be transformed as such that the sequence have the same name. The most commonly used methods is zero padding, which can be pre-sequence padding or post-sequence padding. For pre-sequence padding, we pad the zeros to the beginnings of sequence. While for post-sequence post, uh, post paddings, we pad zeros to the end of the sequence. Keras also provide a pad sequence functions for us to perform pre-sequence or post-sequence padding. The last important note that I want to cover is the input data. In the first LSTM layers in the network, we must define the numbers of inputs or the shape of the input layer. Unlike neural network, LSTM input must be in 3D shape, comprised of samples, time steps, and features in order. Generally, samples are the numbers of the rows in the dataset. Time steps are the past observations of a features. And finally, features is the columns in dataset. Assuming our data is loaded as a NumPy array, we can use reshape functions to convert a 1D or 2D dataset to the required 3D input format. The programming ex exercise is a very common energy consumption problems, which is called short-term low forecasting problems. In our examples, we will predict the next hour loadings in Victoria states in Australia. We will automate the predictions process and plot the results dynamically. We will use four years hourly load data. And instead of using a single layer LSTM or vanilla LSTM, we will apply stacked LSTM. The purpose of stacking LSTM hidden layers is mainly to make the models deeper and because it's very often the depth and complexity of a neural network that is attributed to the success of the approach on a wide range of predictions problems. So let's get started. Uh, first thing first, we need to input the globe in order for us to um, get the path of the data files that I downloaded from the energy at, uh, Australian energy market operator that, is, uh, that contains the low demand and also the price uh, in the past three years. And then I'm going to uh, import the things from the, uh, from, the pan from the pandas. So I'm going to use the uh, pandas uh, to help me to do so. So on the other hand, I also import the NumPy, which uh, will be used to uh, reshape the format into, uh, into a, from a 2D format to a 3D uh, NumPy format in order for us to uh, use it in, in the LSTM. 
So the first thing that I want to do is to append the data into the appended data list. So I used a for loop, loop dot loop. Just like uh, what I mentioned, I want to get all the path, uh, all the Excel file, CSV file from the um, Victoria uh, folder. So, and then I'm going to put all of them into a data frame. I just wait the path and then there's there's a header so I'm going to append all the data from the data frame and finally I because um, this appended data is a list right so I'm going to concat everything From this append the data and then I just um, save it back to a main CSV file for us to use later on but this is not necessary I just save here if, um, to give me a checkpoint to see whether the data are concatenated uh, uh, appropriately so let's run it and take a look on the appended CSV. Here we have six columns, and the first column is the index columns, which is created by the data frame. And then we have the uh, columns that contains the regions, which is the Victoria state. And then we have the columns that contains the settlement date and settlement time. Uh, and then we have the total demand, the spot price, and also the uh, period types, which, which is the trading type. And then we are going to use the data in 216, 217, 218, and 21 line. So what I'm going to do later on is to remove everything from 215, so that means we are not going to use here uh, data uh, starting from here. That means we are going to remove everything above. And then we also have to remove this very last data that is 2020. The main reason that I only keep the data for four years is because low demand very often has a trend due to an organic growth, partly related to GDP or economic development. And for that reason, I tend to use four years of data, which is not too less and not too many samples in order for me to keep our data set as stationary as possible for a better training and prediction. The main reason that I only keep the data for four years is because low demand very often has a trend due to an organic growth, partly related to GDP or economic development. And for that reason, I tend to use four years of data, which is not too less and not too many samples in order for me to keep our data set as stationary as possible for a better training and prediction. Cool. Now let's work on the data. Here, uh, for, first of all, let's take a look on the um, data types that we have after using the painter to extract the data. So you can see that the region is an object type, the settlement date is an object type, the total demand is a flow type that is correct, the price is a flow type that is correct. And then private types is an objects. So 
in that case, we need to work a little bit on the settlement dates because this is a uh, date time types that should not be in object types. So let's, so in that case, let's change, um, use the handles to date, date times functions to convert it. So we have the, let's assign it to a date time column. This is equals to panther dot to date time. And then we are going to change the column set moment date. And then we just separate the date time to to date, month, years, hours, and minutes. So let's separate it using the dt dot date function to get the date, and then similarly. We are going to get the month and change it to month. And then we have the year. Year. Hour. Our and lastly, the minutes and also the minutes. Let's print out the first few columns to make sure we work it out correctly. So here we convert this uh, settlement date, which is an object type, to a uh, separately uh, newly created uh, date times columns, which right now this is the date time objects. And then we get the dates, we get the month, we get the years, we get the hours, and also the minutes from this uh, date time object. So the next things that I'm going to do is to convert uh, this total demands um, to a new column uh, by using the two, two numerical uh, function. This is just to make sure that um, there's nothing wrong with these um, total demands or nothing wrong with the decreated uh, demand column. We're going to use the two numerical functions and then convert the photo column. I'm going to set the error equals to uh, coerce. This coerce is used to, com uh, to convert any invalid values into an NAN. So we are going to have a new column that is called the man. Let's print it out to see what we have. This is the newly created column. And then I'm going to drop all the columns right here because um, they are not uh, useful. And also, I can drop the date times columns because I already separate them into the day, month, year, hour, and minutes. So, which is not necessary uh, for, our, for our usage later on. So, I'm going to drop the, the first one is the total demand.
Let's drop them one by one. The first one is the region. I'm going to drop it. That's it. Equals to one. That means columns in place. Equals to true. That means we are going to amend the data frame. So the next second one is the settlement day. And then the total demand. And then the board price. And then the period type. And finally, the date time. Okay, good. And then I also want to drop out the years uh, that is out of, out of our, our considerations, that is the 2015 and 2020, because I already know the locations of that particular row. So uh, I just drop out the row and by using the ILOC functions and reset the index and drop equals to true. So we just drop the 2015 data and also the 2020 data. And then create two leads first, that is X and the other one is Y. So here X is our features and Y is our labels. What I'm going to do is use a for loops to put to append the values from the data frames and then back to the X and Y. So so the range is um, from zero start and then from the uh, and then to the very last fourteen X step. And then what I'm going to do is to append the 14x snaps, which is in the fifth column, which is our demand. And then the label is the 14 live data. in our sample in the demand column. So what it means is that um, we are going to use 14 next steps to predict the next step that is our target. And then I'm going to put them in the NumPy array, array. X, just convert them into an array. Why? Because the target is one column, so we need to do a little trick right here is to make sure that the target is has, has only one column. Or you could consider it as only a vector. Very good. So to simplify our example, I just uh, use hourly data so to predict an hourly output. So what I'm going to do is to remove uh, every second column and every second row from the uh, uh, array. So here, I just want to delete 
every single every second row Axis equals to one every second um, column. I'm going to remove that, and then I'm going to remove every second row as well. This range uh, next stock shape should be the number of row, and then every second row. And axis equals to zero. And similarly, Y, I also want to do that to keep everything aligned. So here is another checkpoint. I just uh, put everything into a CSV file, and then I will show you what I've done here. And doc CSV, maybe this one, and then another data frame for Y that is the label to CSV and the appended, um, maybe demand one here, yep. So let's move back a little bit to the for loop right here. So what I've done is that I just um, extract, I just put the, 14 numbers of the demands and then to predict the next value in the in the demands right here that is the that is the x is the yellow highlighted and y is the red highlighted so i have a for loops that is move um, uh, move one step at a time so that means the next steps that I have is just move one step ahead. That is 14 egg value. And then to predict the next value and then continues to do that in your Excel files. And finally, we should have two Excel files one contains the labels and one the others contains the features so this is the features files so the row number uh, is the number of samples and then the columns that i have is the number of features that is highlighted in yellows in the previous excel that i show you which is something like this this is one sample and then this is the second sample and so and so. And then you should also have a, uh, have a label, have an Excel contains the labels. And this is the something like the wet targets that I highlighted and show you in the previous Excels and so and so. So now, now our data set is ready. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to normalize the data. So I'm going to import the mean as scalar. And then first we just assign a scalar first, which is the mean mass scalar. And then the range that I'm going to input is zero to one. And then the features we have to use these scalars which uh, we can use a fit and fit transform functions to help us to normalize the data 
So the fit means that we are going to fit this mean mass scale that is between zero to one, and then we are going to transform all the features between zero to zero and one. So similarly, we perform we use the same scalar to fit transform the label set. So y. So we then will split the data set into train and test set. So what I'm going to do is to extract the last 480 data that is about 20 days um, that will be used um, for the testing. So similarly, extract the Y label set, just use the uh, last 480 days for the testing. So what I what I've done here is that I used this is the original data set, so I only use the last 480 status for testing, and other other than that, um, the data will be used for training. So this is um, similarly what we've done for the um, for the label set as well. Remember that uh, the first hidden layers in the network in the LSTM network must define the um, the number of inputs, uh, which is expected to be the shape of the input layers. And then the inputs must be in three dimension, uh, comprised of the samples, time steps, and features in that order. So in that case, we need to use a numpy.reshape functions to help us to do so. So we are going to reshape the X chain and then the first the first number is the number of the sample and then the second number uh, is the number of time step so which will be the shape of the number of features which is actually the number of time step, and then we will contain only one features. That means for the 24 um, hours, previous hours input will be used uh, as a time step sequence. Um, and then this is one, only the single features. And then similarly, we need to um, speed the test in the same similar shape. So I just copied this and then everything will be placed by the pets. So now the input data is ready. What I'm, what I'm going to do next is to um, define the models and set up the model architect for the LSTM. So what I'm going to do is to import a few libraries. Um, what I need is the errors models. Uh, we are going to import sequential. And then for the layers, um, there are several types of layer that we are going to use. Um, this is, we need to use a dense layer for our output. And then we need to assign the activation function. Uh, we also need to assign the LSTM models. So I can import the Qder, um CUDNN LSTM or just a LSTM. Um, it depends on whether you have a GPU or not. If uh, you have a GPU, then CUDNN LSTM uh, would be preferred because um, the training time will be will be shortened, and then if but however if you do not have a 
uh, GPU, then you, you can just use, you can use the LSTM. The next library that I'm going to import is the optimizer, which is used for the uh, learning algorithm. So very good. First, we assign a sequential model object first. Um, so model is equals to the sequential. And then we are going to add some layers to this um, neural network model. And then for the first one, we are going to assign the LSTM layers. Um, I'm going to assign 50, uh, 50 neurons for these layers. And then return sequence is equal to true. Um, because I'm going to stack another LSTM's layers. So you have to set the return sequence equals to true. Otherwise, if you do not have an, uh, later on, you, you do not have a LSTM layers, then you have to set it to false. And then because this is the first layer, you have to provide the input shape. Input shape equals to um, that is the X train dog shape. That is the um, um, that is the time step, and then the features is only equals to one. So the next things that I'm going to add is uh, CU DNN LSTM again. So it contains 15 neurons again, but the return sequence at this time. Uh, we are going to set it to false. Because uh, we, we have uh, the next layer is no longer a LSTM layer. And then we add a fully connected layer, um, around 15 neurons. Again, the activation functions that I'm going to use is value. So finally, because we have a single output, so I'm going to use a dense layer that contains only one single neuron. Because I want to um, save, uh, save the trained models as well as uh, want to uh, have a early stopping functions in order to avoid the overfitting issue. So I also import another libraries from the Keras, which is the callback library. And then we will import the model checkpoint, uh, which is used for saving the models. And then we are also import the early stopping, which is used to avoid the overfitting. So we need to provide a file path and then it depends on where you would like to save. I just want to save the save everything inside our models, uh, models folders. Uh, the file names will be the uh, epoch, and then the loss value, the validation loss value, and the MAE mean absolute error values, and also the validation mean uh, absolute absolute error. So that means there are four parameters that is going to be saved uh, in the file names, which, uh, uh, which is uh, just for ease of my reference for me to keep chat on the, on the, on the, on the accuracy or on the error uh, of that mod of that particular models. On the other hand, I, I'm going to set up a callback which um, is used to early stop uh, the model, the, the training. So early stopping, what I'm going to monitor is the validation loss. That is the mean absolute, uh, that is, that should be the mean square error in our cases. And then I'm going to give a patient that means uh, how many steps that we are going to wait uh, until there's no further improvement. 
and then I'm going to give the file path for this for the models and what I'm going to monitor is just the losses and finally I'm going to just save the um, best only models and the mole is the is equals to mean because we are going to minimize the loss value. The next thing that I'm going to assign is the optimizer. Uh, I'm going to use atoms. So our MS pop should also because the model the because the the problems or the objectives of this pop of this uh, uh, of this case um, is not so hard so RMS pop should also uh, work uh, very well however here I just use the atom and then just uh, compile everything that includes the optimizer uh, equals to Adam and uh, the loss functions that I'm going to use is MSE and I also want to track uh, the matrix uh, that is the MAE yep. you can also add any others performance metrics that you would like to track and finally I can fit everything into the model so uh, I fit the I fit the training data and then the validation speed uh, I'm going to speed the 20 percent of the data for the validation and then approach I'm going to set it for a thousand and then callback equals to callback that is uh, what we assigned it here and then the batch size because we do not have so many sample we can just set it like uh, around 10 should be fine and now we are ready to train our models After running for around two hours, um, we find the best model, which is at the 134 epoch. So I save the weight and then put it into the same directory with the uh, this program file. So I can load the model. And I also rename the file to one, 134. So we can load the file and use it for the predictions. So what I'm going to do is the is to keep everything the same and then just uh, comment these fit functions and then add these low weight um, files, low weight functions to load the rating of these uh, LSTM models in order for us to use it for the predictions. Because what we are going to do is to automate this um, predictions process and automate the animations or the plotting in real time. So what I'm going to do is to import a time which can be considered as a timer for us to um, perform the predictions at every time at every defined time interval.
So here I'm going to create a for loop, which will be used to, um, to get the data from the testing set. So I'm going to use uh, the range should be from zero and then to the end of to the total number of the sample. But in 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 practical, so uh, you 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 better use a while loop right here in order for you to keep predicting the uh, the low for the low below demand and also for use to continue to update the um, the CSV files in order for use to continue to uh, plotting the real time hourly predictions. But here I just used the testing um, testing samples to show you how I could uh, perform the real time predictions and real time plotting. I so I'm going to create a demand summary, which is just a list for me to append the actual demand and also forecasting demands into this demand summary. So I'm going to create a X input, which will contain the sample input from the testing set. So I'm going to reshape this X input to one. That means this only contains a one sample. And then the time step should be the X input shape um, zero. And then we are going to have only one single features, number of features. So we will just put the input uh, into the model predict. So, so the X input uh, will now, will now becomes the output of these predictions. Remember that we uh, previously, we use a min mass scalar to transform the X. So right now we need to use a scalar dog inverse transform to we scale it back to the original scale. So right now we have the forecast value. I'm also going to give you the actual value. So that is the x, that is the y value from the y testing. So you are going to have a, I'm going to use the y test and then give you a y input. So because this is just a single number, I'm going to reshape, reshape it back to just to a single number that's it the one one and then the actual remember that we need to uh, always just uh, always to uh, inverse transform it transform it back to the original scale so now we have the forecast value and also the actual value in the plot so I'm going to append. Firstly, we append the for the actual value, and then I'm going to 
extend it into the same list um, with the forecast value. And then I'm going to put it into a data frame in order for me to update this file into a CSV file so that the animations can pull out the value from that file. So we have the data frame, demand, summary, and then this is the EF anime. I need to put everything into a row. So I need to transform it, transpose it, sorry. So before we put it into a CSV file. So um, the name of the CSV file is real time demand doc CSV. And then the mode is A, that means we are going to append the data file. The header is false, we don't have a header. Uh, the index is false, we don't have an index. Here I just want to print out the demand summary in order for us to keep track on the predictions. Additionally, I also give a timer right here so that you don't have to predict uh, for every, every single second or every single minute. So uh, say for example, if you are going to perform a hourly, um, hourly prediction, so you can wait until the last uh, minutes to, in order for you to perform the prediction. So, so that you can set the timers for, for an hour, or you can set the timers to be around 59 minutes. But here, I just want to show you an example. So I just set it a 0 0.5. So that means the Python program will, will sleep uh, for a 0 0.5 second. So our dynamic low forecast, short term low forecasting model is ready right here. So here we are going to continue to update the predictions. So um, just like what I mentioned before, if you are going to have the real time data updates into your CSV files, so it would be better to change this for loop to a while loop. So in order for these programs to continue pull out the data from the updated uh, from the updated database. And now we can move on to create an other Python program files in order for us to continue to plotting the data, plotting the predictions to be precise. So what we are going to import is, is to import pandas as PD, and we are also going to import the matplotlib um, dot py plot as plt, and we also want to import the matplotlib animation as animation. And then we also want to use a specific style for our potting. And first of all, we just uh, give a style um, to the plot. The style that I'm going to use is five, 38 and then we just uh, create a figure object and give a size for the figures
and create a SC1 for the figures. And I'm going to, because we only have one uh, plot, so I just use 111 for the subplot to assign it to a SC1 here. So let's define the animation function. That is the define anime i, and then we are going to with the CSV file, which will continue to update by another by the previous uh, LSTM Python program, and then we are going to extract the very last value from that part. So we are going to have ys and ys1, which, which is used to extract the very last value. Remember that we assign it to the um, by using the demand summary right there. So the first value is the actual value and the second value is the forecast value. So here you can see that, that the ys will be the actual value and then the first and then the second value is the forecast value. To keep a fixed window in your plot, here I give an uh, if statement. If the time step is larger than 122, that means around five days, I am going to only extract the data at the end of the file. So the YS1 and Y uh, and the YS and YS1 are just extracting the last 122 value, which is the latest updated value from the file. So now the five value is ready. So what I'm going to do is to give it a X axis value uh, that is just the just list out the range from the ys plus one and then I'm going to clear everything. and plot out the actual value first and then plot out the forecast value at the same part and perhaps i can give it a better title that is an one hour ahead low forecasting and that is for the Victoria Australia that is the unit is in megawatt and then the font size is equals to 32 and I can also set the legend That is the forecast and metro. Oh, that should be the actual first and then forecast. Uh, 
and then the position should be around lower right corner. And that's it for this animation function. So I'm going to put it into the using the fun animation and put the figure objects inside it and then put the function inside it, which is the animate. And then the interval, you can set it appropriately according to um, your, uh, your, your, your side prediction. Say for example, for one hour, you can set a longer interval. Right now, I just use 500 milliseconds to match this 0 0.5 slipping setting and finally we can give a tighter layout for the for the pod and the plt doc show here so now our predictions model is ready our plotting plotting python programs is ready so you you can firstly uh, run the predictions files, and then you can run the plotting files. And let me show you uh, how we can do that. We just go back to the RSTM file and then run it. And then we go to the animations file and then wait until the RMS file starts predicting. We can then run the plotting file. After watching this video, I hope you would be able to develop RSTM models for your own time series predictions problems, as well as other more general sequence problems, and also know how to automate the process and visualize the results in real time. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoy and thank you for watching. If you have any questions or suggestions about what we covered in this video, please feel free to ask in the comment section below, and I will do my best to answer. And if you enjoyed this tutorial, you can subscribe my channel, simply like the video, and it is a great support to share this video with anyone who you think would find them useful. And thank you all for watching.